Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Morgan Redfield. Morgan is a senior embedded engineer for an undisclosed startup. Um, Morgan, welcome to the pod. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. i uh always excited to get like another hardware guy on because I feel like it's been a lot of like yeah, data scientists I've, lately. I've started with hardware. I, uh, I actually got my start doing electrical engineering and have really moved a lot more in the software direction, kind of like a lot of people these days. Uh, so right now it's all software all the time at work, but uh, hardware really is my roots and it's uh, it's where I got my start. It's my true love. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I feel the same way. Um, I actually don't do any software at all at work. <laughs> all right. I, I don't know whether to be sad for you or happy for you about that. It's just kind of an ultimatum that I've issued to every company I've ever worked for. <laughs> Nice. Uh, but I did in my last job, or I, I guess I'm still, anyway, in, in, in one of the jobs I've done, I um, had to oversee software projects from like a level above. Um, so, you know, they're software project managers and I manage those guys. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Drinking uh, Boyd and Blair rum uh, here from Pennsylvania. It's good. It's quite good. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. De decent spiced rum. Uh, give me money, Boyd and Blair. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, all right, so hardware versus software, code review. So one thing I'll say about hardware and software, um, hardware people tend to be much more disorganized. And <laughs> it's not that software people aren't disorganized, it's that they put processes in place that help them out. So kind of the best thing from my perspective of going into the software teams is having continuous integration systems set up, having um, software systems set up that just check everything for you automatically. Yep. And my experience with hardware is there's a lot more like, go check out this Google Drive. Here's like 40 different different docs. Uh, which one is the right one? Who knows? Been there. Yeah. yeah. How do you solve that problem? Um, I mean, in the past, uh, we used GrabCAD for like uh, MCAD. Uh, I don't know that we had a good equivalent to that for like Altium. Um, Altium has the vault, which is pretty nice, uh, but with hardware designs in general, since it's not, uh, it, there's not like a, an easy way to do a diff. Yeah. So you kind of have to check out the whole thing. Yeah. For, well, GrabCab is pretty good, but like it's owned by Stratasys. And I don't know if you've like heard the MakerBot no, stories about that. So when, I mean, I might be getting some details wrong here, but the, what I heard is that when, um, what is it? When Stratasys, uh, the 3D printer company, acquired MakerBot, they um, made the MakerBot forms into like Stratasys IP. So they just took all these people's ideas and were like, yeah, we own all that now. And Did that like, work? Wasn't was it all like, open source to begin with? I think it was, but I think there was like some back door that allowed them to do it. It might have been like an assignment. If I had to guess, I mean, I'm not huh. a lawyer, obviously. but Man, that sucks for everybody that was working on that, except yeah. the few who got paid, probably. <laughs> Yeah, for sure, for sure. But like all the open source idealists that got dicked over, like I yeah. feel bad. Well, that's what the RepRap project is for, right? Like there's still open source printer projects. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, so I come from Seattle and spent a lot of time uh, at some of the hacker like spaces there. It's a great city. Um, a yeah. lot of really interesting hackers there. Uh, but one of the hacker spaces there, Metrics Create Space, uh, it's closed now, but it had like a solid seven year run. Um, I spent a lot of time there building 3D printers and um, like tweaking different designs and uh, oh, cool. especially like looking into ways to uh, reproduce them even more rapidly. So instead of like 3D printing printer parts, we'd 3D print parts that would be molds and we would just cast printers way faster than you could print them. So Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, we, we did that for BattleBots for a little bit. Oh, cool. Um, I, I had one friend that would, he would do it a little bit differently so he would 3d print like like a concrete you know like uh like a case i don't know if case on is the right word but like like basically um you'd fill it with with the jizz and then you know sure. it, it would solidify but then you'd keep the the pla on the outside of it because like who cares oh interesting okay i think it was just laziness so he would just print the shell and yeah. the shell would be the the actual and then he'd fill it with urethane from cool. like bjb with like i think he put in kevlar pulp cool i like that idea that's that's fun. Yeah, it was a neat one. But the thing is, with me and stuff like BattleBots, I always, I, I kind of sucked at it because I would always spend like way more time on the 
the engineering and the build than I would on like learning how to drive the fucking thing. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I would do pretty abysmally in competition. And there was like a... You need the partner who's just like really into driving them. Yeah. You build them, he drives them. Different types of autism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Get the guy who's there to optimize just the weapons. Like, yep. yeah, my, my poker, it like only penetrated what? one inch. You got to get that pressure up. I, I think that's what like the, the uh, drone inspection companies are doing is they're all hiring like gamers to be their, their uh, operators. Man, that's that probably what fun. the military does too with the drone program, to be honest. Yeah. Kind of terrifying. Yeah. But that t makes total sense. Although imagine being that person, like... They get PTSD for days, I mean, when they realize. <laughs> yeah. 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 Flying a predator and then just going home and, like... Realizing going you've to got, play. like, a kill count of, like, yeah. 100 people. <laughs> you would probably look at your uh, your normal gaming pretty differently, I think. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure. Uh, it's definitely a thing, for sure. <laughs> I did a lot of uh defense work mostly in the space industry oh cool and it was um it was always kind of walking the razor's edge because i like really like a lot of the technologies that oh go well, i feel the same stuff, way but i don't really want to like build weapons Murder or terminators yeah all that stuff um, yeah so um i got to talk to a lot of people who were very much in that world and it's just a totally different mindset. Well, I think a lot of them too, like, don't like it either, but like, you know, just kind of figure out a way to reconcile. Some of them don't give a yeah. fuck, obviously. I think a lot of them don't give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> I do have one friend that worked for SRI International, and his opinion is that he's like, I'm not offended by the killing. I'm offended by the waste. <laughs> like, like the overspending. All right. And stupid, like, you know, like the, you know, $200 bolt. I think he's more offended by than the murder. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's Got to make your Terminators efficient. Yeah, I mean, or at least, you know, like, capital efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Dollars per kill as low as possible. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, but it is kind of funny when you look at, like, what some of these missiles cost or, you know, like, what we spend. Like, I mean, like, I think a fifty caliber bullet's, like, $10 or something. Whoa. And we have machine yeah. guns that shoot, like, 600 of those a minute. So, like, man, a lot of money. Yeah, for sure. And then I think we have the, I, I don't know if we make 50 cal depleted uranium, but imagine what that costs. Like, I have no idea, but. Yeah. And then the Navy goes and they dump those overboard because, you know, like some convention made them illegal or they want to oh. get their same allotment the next year. And if they don't use it all up, they won't get the same amount. So I don't know. I mean, yeah. It's, it's all stories I've heard from different people. There's, there's a lot of weird stuff that goes on in government. But yeah. one thing I will say about defense work is a lot of it does feed into the, um, the commercial industry in ways that are pretty surprising. Um, like for me, for myself, I, uh, I used what I called the cell phone test. Like, you know, people who built cell phones, they're used for all kinds of military applications. And especially, uh, historically when, uh, that technology was first being developed. Um, you, are you talking about like as far back as World War II? Or yeah, as far back as World War II, but even more recently in like the seventies, like all kinds of communication technology and, uh, and coding technologies for, was developed for the military. Yeah. But at this point, like the amount of humanitarian good that they're doing is just overwhelming. When you look at the amount of innovations that can... Oh, so here's an interesting one. Is, like, think about, like, the shit the Nazis did in concentration camps, like putting humans in vacuum chambers and the contributions to the space program as a result of that. I mean, yes and no. Um, <laughs> there's definitely... Uh, what was it, Mengele, who did a lot of the biological... Dr. Mengele, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what I've read is that the amount of, like, actual science that anybody got from him is like minuscule actually okay yeah. that's interesting like he did a lot of just totally messed up stuff well, like for sure i mean like <laughs> sending people eyeballs through the mail like that Wait, kind of yeah just totally bananas why stuff. would you do that like that doesn't even i don't know man he was crazy probably just for fun yeah at that point yeah but like the the actual science that uh he developed is like nothing he just like did a lot of experiments and like made a lot of noise yeah so. I don't know, though. I, I have friends that have, like, worked on the astronaut program at NASA that have said that, like, like a lot of just knowing the operational parameters of a human huh. like, is... Interesting. Well, I know... Like, we're how are you going to find that out except, you know, like, yeah. kind of fucked up? Yeah. I mean, a yeah, Ron Brown was a Nazi for sure. <laughs> like, yeah. B2 program. Yeah, for sure. And, like, he did probably more than anybody else to get the space program going. Um, yeah, yeah, and for sure. Without him. Saturn like, 5. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
but uh, tallest rocket ever. At the same time, like killed a lot of people and like used a lot of slaves to do it. Oh fuck yeah! Do you remember? Um, do you know Tom Lara, like the the satire singer? Uh, yeah, yeah. What yeah. about him? I just love the song about Werner von Braun. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Call him a Nazi, he won't even frown. Nazi schmatzi, so it's Werner von Braun. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. It's been a long time since I've listened to that. Yeah, it's fun. My dad got me into that stuff when I was a kid. So. Nice. Uh, I think my favorite Tom Lara song is National Brotherhood Week. Okay, I haven't heard that one. It's, uh, I don't want to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. Yeah. We'll do it after. It's about, okay, so like the premise of the song is that there's like one week a year where people are supposed to not be racist. Okay. And so it's it's like incredibly sarcastic, you know, and it's it's just singing about how like everybody hates everybody, but during this one week they all get along. Awesome. <laughs> all right. So I think I think the 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 line in is okay. So it's not it's like oh the white folks hate the black folks and the black folks hate the white folks to hate all but the right folks is an old established rule. But during National Brotherhood Week, <laughs> National Brotherhood Week. Cool. Yeah, that's that's basically it. But they've all these great lyrics, like you know, it's like, and the Hindus hate the Muslims, and everybody hates the Jews. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Oh man, that reminds me of uh, Flight of the Concords. They've got the yeah, song about very, the dragon. Very yeah, yeah. I don't I actually haven't listened to them in a while. What's? Yeah, I, they were like super popular ten years ago or something, but I don't remember. I yeah, don't... yeah, same. Like I feel like John Lejoie, Flight of the Concords. Um, I heard that what's his dick McGillicuddy came out with something recently. Uh, Haven't heard of it. It's not really a, the guy's name. Um, like that kid that was making those YouTube videos where he played the piano. Um, that describes like thousands of kids. Fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> the hell was the dude's name? I can't remember. He had like a Netflix special recently that was meant to have been good, but I can't remember the dude's name. I'm sure it was super interesting. I don't know. Shit. <laughs> All right, I'll give you plus one internet point. Plus one internet point for not watching it. That's right. Nice. Yeah, I did. I did like those John Lachois videos back in the day. It's like the everyday normal guy raps. Those were fun. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's been a long time. Yeah, no. I mean, he's making. I think he's still doing the league, right? And so he's like getting more money that way, so he's not making YouTube videos. Huh. Okay. Yeah, I haven't really kept up. Yeah, I know. Kind of, kind of a fad, I think, but. It's fun for a minute. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Cool. So, I guess, can you talk about like some of the stuff you worked at in the space program? Yeah, uh, I've done a lot of different, uh, very tiny projects in the space industry. Um, do you know about uh, SBIRs? I do. Okay. A little bit. I've, I've not gotten two phase ones that I've applied for. <laughs> okay. So... For your audience, I'll just say like yeah, the small FBIR business program. innovation research grant. Uh, it's a lot of paperwork uh, for a dubious outcome. An enormous amount of paperwork, but if you're a small company, it's a very good way to get like enough funding for six to twelve months of. What if you run the numbers right? If if you just become an SBIR factory and you hire like two full time administrators to just crank them out all day long, like you'll do well, I think. Like I, yeah. I, I crunched it one time and it, it would, I think it's a profitable business model. You've got to have some pretty good uh, proposal writers, but assuming that you've got that down, it's it's pretty decent I way think, to fund your research. I think getting like, what is it? Like one in four is considered very good. So you've got to be yeah, putting okay. out like 12 a year to really have it make sense, I would think. And even then you're only getting like 450,000 if you're doing phase ones. Yeah, a lot of these are for companies that are like, you know, five to 100 people-ish. Yeah. So um, pretty small. But what I've seen, I've seen companies do it very poorly and seen companies do it very well. Um, the ones that do it well have like a product that they're aiming at that's going to take a lot of R&D. And they just kind of piecemeal it out into different SBIRs and build up to this major product that they're going to release publicly. Uh, but I've also seen companies get trapped where they're like, we just got to get another SBAR to keep going. Um, so I've worked at a couple of those places. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Worked at a couple of those places um, on various small satellite projects, uh, mostly like communications, um, like satellite crosslinks, RF crosslinks. Um, that means like a satellite talking to a satellite? Yeah, exactly. Um, so 
uh the so big that's, that's the comms device or the whole satellite or both mostly the comms device okay got it um so a good example here is um spacex with uh um with their uh starlink um right now they're still working on getting their crosslinks going but what oh, they do um so they but they've launched a fuckload of those things yeah they? yeah they have and they don't talk to each other um so they, they um if you look at the orbits they have a bunch of um uh a bunch of rings that kind of overlap at the poles, basically. Um, and so they'll talk to each other, uh, I, I think, along uh, along the orbit. So they'll talk to the next one that's kind oh, of farther along. But they won't talk to the ones that are sideways. Um, Wait, OK, so I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm just struggling to comprehend the geometry. Um, so you've got a bunch of rings around like different, like, so the Earth is rotating this way. Sure. You've got all these satellites and like geo Synchronous orbit, I think, and then you've got there. There, none of the Starlink satellites are in geosynchronous. Okay. So, so actually, um, most of the satellite constellations that you hear about these days, um, especially like uh, commercial or public satellite constellations, are all fairly low orbit. So, so way below uh, geosynchronous. And actually, if you go out in a, a, a cloudless night and you look up, a lot of times you can see the satellite moving across the yeah, um, yeah across that. the sky. So those are pretty low satellites, just reflecting sunlight. And um, the exact orbit depends on what the satellite's doing and kind of what they want to look at. But uh, for a lot of satellites that are in polar orbits, they'll be just kind of going around the Earth and uh, the polar orbit is so so north to south okay. um, or south to north. So like this is the North Pole, this is the South Pole. The satellites doing exactly, that. exactly, as opposed to like going around this way or some other Which way. Which isn't necessarily geosynchronous, but it's like right. and so, geosynchronous satellites doing it just at the same speed as the Earth. Yeah, so with the geosynchronous satellite, um, the, the speed of a satellite is, um, and this is kind of getting into a physics lesson here, but the speed of a satellite I mean, I determines its like orbit. Uh, so if you want to... Well, that kind of makes sense, actually, given like the fucking cannon thing with... Yeah, exactly. Um, so shoot a cannonball fast enough, it'll go all the way around the Earth before it falls back. Assuming no air resistance. Exactly. Get up high enough and there is no air res resistance. Ooh. Um, so the, the speed that it's going is going to determine what the actual uh, altitude of the orbit is. So geosynchronous satellites are actually a very specific altitude. Um, so you have to go up okay, pretty cool. high okay. to get there. That makes sense. Uh, and, and so this is one of the reasons so altitude's that... altitude is directly proportional to speed. Um, right. And you've got to have a certain amount to have escape velocity and orbit the Earth. Yeah, basically. Okay. Um, and so for all these mega constellations... Um, generally, they're pretty low. Uh, they're pretty low down, and a lot of reasons for that. But if you have a big constellation, I would imagine it's cheaper. It's cheaper. You don't have to um, pay as much for launch costs, but also it, the orbits degrade faster. So a lot of Is people that because you do have air resistance. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Um, air resistance, and then actually, you may not have heard this. Uh, one of the more recent Starlink launches lost like 38 satellites to air resistance. Oh, really? Um, yeah, because there was a solar flare and the atmosphere of the Earth really kind of moves a lot with with with, uh, uh, with different space weather. Yeah. So like, if there's a solar flare, the atmosphere of the Earth is going to kind of uh, get a little bit bigger. Thicker. Uh, create a lot more drag on low satellites. Yeah, makes sense. And Especially right after launch, Starlink satellites are super low before they boost themselves into their final orbit. So there's like some kind of a rocket or pneumatic that fires or something? Yeah, they have their own engines for station okay, cool. keeping um, and probably also for deorbiting. How long do those work for? Uh, I mean, they very rarely turn them on. So um, once once they get up to their uh, target altitude, they probably just turn it off and then they have enough fuel to station keep for some number of years. Okay, cool. Um, but then, like, when they launch them, they launch them into some low orbit, and then they have to boost them up. And so that's, like, a, uh, probably a pretty long burn. Okay, and so that's probably the majority of the fuel usage, and then they keep a little right. bit reserved for, like, adjustment or station keeping? Or for both. station keeping, for adjustment, um, potentially for deorbiting, depending on what they're going to do. Um, so that's like, like, we're decommissioning this, we're just going to burn it Exactly, up. Okay. exactly, yeah. And one of the reasons that people really like low orbits is that it's easy to decommission a satellite. Um, and a lot of times you can just say, well, that satellite, um, it's done. We're not going to use it anymore. Uh, we're not going to bother wasting fuel to deorbit um, or like sending the fuel up there in the first place to deorbit it. But, you know, we'll wait, wait so they six send months. Fuel and... two satellites to refuel them sometimes? Currently, no. Uh, people are working on that. Okay, cool. um, but, but I'm actually talking about... I would think that would be like... really, really complicated to grapple. Yeah. 
Actually, I had a guy on here that was talking about uh, trying to create a satellite grappling robot in the 80s. Oh, cool. Yeah, and they, they didn't solve it. He was with Grumman. Uh, <laughs> there are, um, there's a couple of uh, satellites in orbit now, I think, that are uh, doing experiments with that. That's cool. Um, and that's one of the big tasks that SpaceX is going to have to um, figure out for, uh, for Starship especially, is like they have this whole plan to launch a bunch of Starships and refuel in orbit, but I don't think that we've actually successfully refueled. I didn't realize like that, that was part of it now. That's interesting. Because I know they wanted yeah. to make fuel on Mars was like a big thing back in the day. Right. I, but even to get to Mars, um, like they launch into orbit and they launch a bunch more starships, which refuel the first one. Oh, interesting. Uh, they, they use the same vehicle for that just to save engineering money? Yeah. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. Uh, the first starship, which got refueled, goes back, uh, goes to Mars. All the rest of them go back to Earth to get refueled to like refuel the next expensive one. Expensive as fuck to manufacture, I'm sure. For sure. Yeah. And like you have to get the refueling in space done. Um, and so this is one of the reasons that. Um, there was so much. Yeah, it kind of makes and, and the amount of fuel you probably get up there by the time you leave Earth's orbit, I'm sure, isn't, yeah. isn't a ton. For sure. But because you don't have to escape Earth's orbit, you don't need as much to, to go that way, whatever. This is really yes. rude about, This is me like trying to understand it as a little kid. Uh, I think that's about right, yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm going to keep doing my um, SpaceX fanboy thing here. No, I used to be a SpaceX intern. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, nice. Yeah. Um, well, they, they're trying to like use Starship for the uh, human lunar lander. Um, like they got uh, NASA money to do that, right? Interesting. And, but they um, want to like land a whole Starship? Or yes. Like... Yeah. Which is um, going to be very interesting if That's they do silly. it. Uh, <laughs> maybe not silly. There was a huge kerfuffle uh, maybe a year ago because uh spacex bid on it and also blue origin jeff bezos's thing bid on it yeah, yeah no. and then you know spacex won blue origin didn't I actually tried to get another internship at blue but one of my <laughs> classmates from grad school blocked me you maybe didn't miss out um, <laughs> did you work for them i i did not work for them but yeah. there's um some uh some bad gossip out of there so i mean i think all those companies work people pretty brutally to be honest that's true um what I've heard about Blue Origin is worse, but also like I don't know too many people who actually work there, so it's all like second or third hand. So probably shouldn't shouldn't repeat it here. Well, I mean, I yeah, fair enough. I mean, I all I know is that like one of my classmates got in there and just made sure I didn't get hired. <laughs> Rude. Uh, yeah, I mean, the guy didn't really know me. There was like another classmate that he and I didn't get along, and it was like you know it was like a a favor I, to fuck me over to the other guy. It was weird. That sounds super weird. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, you'll be glad to know Blue Origin made a horrible mistake not hiring you. Also made horrible mistakes in their uh, proposal to NASA. And um, they ended up suing the government about this and like trying to get uh, um, additional money from NASA for this. And one of the things that they were complaining about is how many times uh, SpaceX would have to refuel the, uh, the Starship um, in order to get it on to uh, get it to the moon. Yeah. And they, they have this like fairly complex procedure to do that that has various like um, single points of failure and safety concerns. Oh, but, interesting. Um, Sp SpaceX like convinced NASA that it would work. So yeah, um, it'll be interesting to see. So Blue Origins thing was like, it's probably not going to work. Yeah, uh, they took a very traditionalist approach to, oh, to lunar landing. So if you look at um, what we did with Apollo. Yeah, smaller and smaller and smaller vehicles till you get there. Exactly. And that's basically what uh, what Blue Origin was trying. Um, and this means that they were landing like a, a pretty small vehicle that had a pretty low cargo capacity yeah. compared to Starship, where it's like multiple tons of material they could bring back. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I don't know. I can't remember the crew that one of those carries, but it's pretty massive. Yeah, definitely. And it sounds like they're going to have a lot of different uh, configurations of it, too. So, yeah, yeah, for um, sure. Like high crew configuration, high cargo configuration. Um, and I personally am pumped about the... Uh, it's a cool machine. Like, yeah. You need to see that finally coming to fruition. Yeah, for sure. I remember when it was hush-hush back in the day and couldn't talk about it. Yeah. Uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see it fly. Yeah, for sure. Um yeah. Anyway, I have nothing to do with SpaceX. I just like their stuff. Yeah, uh, sure. No, my experience. I wore my is... SpaceX shirt to work yesterday. Sweet. Yeah.
That's points. I, I, I gave away most of my SpaceX swag because they were like $6 shirts when you worked there. So it was like the cheapest clothes you could buy. <laughs> okay. Like the kind of shirt where you have to force yourself to wear it. Well, they were American apparel, so they were like comfy, but okay. like SpaceX bought them in bulk and sold them at cost to, to their employees. And so every Not SpaceX employee... Shirt. Well, it, was, it wasn't free, but it was like dirt cheap. And so like, I mean, the interns at least like didn't get paid a whole lot for where we lived. And so it was like a grand a week in Los Angeles. Okay. So, um, I know, maybe I should cut that out, but <laughs> so many years ago, like that can't be enforceable at this point. I don't even know what cost of living is like in Los Angeles. I so more like the NDA I signed when I went oh, there. Sure. Like, sure, sure. 2013, you know? <laughs> but like, anyway, um, so uh, what was it? Okay, so... It wasn't a lot of money, um, and you know, living cheaply. So it's like, I'll take a six dollar shirt. I'll take twelve six dollar shirts. Sure. And like, it was kind of a cool like. It, if I have a friend like you that loves SpaceX, that's like a great gift that only cost me six dollars. I would wear that shirt. Yeah, and I, I gave them away to like a whole bunch. Like I, I gave all away except for this one that has a hole in the armpit. That's the one I wore to work yesterday. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So space is cool. SpaceX also cool. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, crosslinks, though. Crosslinks are hard. Yeah. Um, so what, what I, I guess you said that the Starlink satellites can talk to the adjacent one, but they can't. What denotes the crosslink versus what they're already doing? So if you have a bunch of satellites, like consider a train of satellites going in polar orbit, and then you have another train of satellites like shifted west by 100 miles or something. Got it. Um, and so they kind of like the two trains of uh kind of overlap with each other at the poles but otherwise they're they're split like this um and so you can it's it's pretty easy to talk to a satellite that's uh immediately in front of you because it's always going to be like the same direction yeah it's pretty easy to talk to a satellite that's directly behind you because it's always the same direction yeah but talking to a satellite that's east or west of you that's actually pretty difficult because the direction changes depending on what time it is so you when have to do targeting changes. exactly yeah um SpaceX is doing and like you use directional antennas to communicate. Yeah, like well, this. SpaceX is doing uh, laser crosslinks, um, so they're going to have really high bandwidth, but also their so uh, their aim aiming that. is going to be much more difficult. Yeah, right. Um, whereas I was doing a lot of RF crosslinks for some NASA SBIRs, and that was, um, you know, you can do some phased array stuff to aim it. Yeah, I would imagine like similar to like a phased array radar. Exactly, yeah. but yeah. also your um, your antenna lobe is still going to be much larger than like a, a laser. So you don't quite have to aim it just as as well as you would with a laser crosslink. Yeah, it makes sense. You've got that big bulbous motherfucker. Totally. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that was that was super fun. That's kind of actually how I got my start in um, in space stuff, and uh, from there ended up going to Astrobotic here in Pittsburgh and working on um, some hardware for their lunar landers. Oh, cool. Um, have they put anything in orbit yet? They have uh, some hardware on the ISS. Sweet. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was very exciting when that got up there. Um, what actually, was that? I, I haven't been following them that closely lately. So uh, the ISS has this um, uh, the setup they call the Astrobee, um, which is this little yeah, like, floating robot. It's kind of um, silly looking, but yeah, yeah. Um, but it's like. You know, pretty cool. Um, has different like little payload bays, so you can put uh, put your own payload in That's it. That's cool. So I uh, might have actually seen that SBIR uh, yeah. RFQ. Yeah. Uh, they've got a bunch of different stuff there. I, I, I think I considered bidding on that one for SK. Nice. Yeah. You should have. Um, there's there's a lot of really cool stuff that they're they're trying to do up there. I'm never doing another SBIR <laughs> as long as I live. I feel you on that. There's really an enormous amount of documentation and, and bookkeeping you have to do compared to the level of engineering that you do. I got disqualified for one because I had the wrong confidentiality footer on it after an ungodly right. amount of work. So, doing that again. Yeah, it's it's not very fun. Um, the engineering work is fun because you're generally like working on really cutting edge stuff. And that's I agree. kind of the point of the, the SBAR, but gen yeah. the, the amount of overhead is high. Yeah, um, I don't know if the, the juice is worth the squeeze for me personally. But, yeah, fair. I mean, and I don't know. I mean, there's stories as old as dirt where, like, a lot of companies have just gone bust, like, trying to get a government grant and, like, delivering and delivering and delivering, you know, for, like, I guess weapons contracts. You see that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. The government just never signs the check and they just go out of business. 
On the other hand, that's how a lot of like big defense contractors got their start. Right? That's true. So. That's true. Well, and then there's like RE squared here in Pittsburgh got their start that way. Really, uh, I didn't know Near that. Near autonomy. Uh, well, those were all SBR factories at first. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Carnegie Robotics, I think, as well. Hmm. NREC okay. to some extent, although they might have done the STTR thing. I don't. I don't Interesting. Remember. Huh. Yeah. NREC did the DARPA Grand Challenge, right? I think I think CMU had a different team than NREC, right? Like, if I'm not mistaken. I think the Field Robotics Center had one team and NREC had a different team, but I might be okay. wrong. So I might be wrong on that. Don't, is, don't quote me on that. NREC is an interesting beast because I had basically never heard about it before moving to Pittsburgh. But now that I'm here, everybody talks about it, and it seems like every robotics company is descended from there in some way or another. Yeah. Is it like a every, part of CMU? Or? It is. Okay. So it's it's like CMU's commercial arm, and it's sep it's technically a separate entity, I think, because CMU has a tax exempt status. Okay. It's like some weird voodoo not paying taxes shit. <laughs> Always fun. Well, so what what gets my goat is that, um, what gets my goat, what, what, I don't know. It's kind of ridiculous. Is that like you know UPMC is a not for profit? I did know that. Yeah. Yeah, like the biggest hospital group in Pittsburgh that is making a buttload of profit, <laughs> and somehow not paying their nurses. I heard there was going to be a strike soon. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. I kind of have a bone to pick with them because um, my dad uh, is an orthopedic surgeon, and he lost two practices in the '90s because you know those big hospital groups kind of squeezed all the private practices. Yeah. Huh. Uh, and I, know, I miss private practice. I miss I miss being able to go to the doctor and like being able to call up the person and they know you and it's not just some random hotline. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know much about hospitals. So I, I grew up. So I, I used to go. Um, you know, um, what is it like? Um, I think West Penn. So the, there's a the hospital in Liberty. My dad had an okay. office there when I was growing up, and um, I think the way it worked. I'm probably gonna get this wrong is that he was like on call in the emergency room. Like, so like he would get woken up at like three in the morning to come fix people that were broken. And then harsh. Yeah. Yeah. Then he, it's a hard time to get woken up for sure. Then he would like kick holes in the wall and stuff when that would happen. And then, um, I remember, uh, so he did that, but then he also like, like it was a weird thing to see, like he would do that. I guess that's like paying your dues. You'd acquire patients that way. But then you paid rent and you had your own business inside the hospital. Interesting. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure I'm getting some detail wrong on how that actually works, but that seemed like sort of the gist of it. And then, um, yeah. So when I was like, you know, like I want to say like 10 years old, um, we would send like past due notices to his patients. Um, and then, uh, as a reward for doing this, we didn't get any money, but we got syringes without the needles on them. And we would use them like <laughs> squirt guns and chase each other around the office. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> so you got to do all the envelope stuffing, basically. Yeah, exactly. It's just child labor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this is how you ended up. Got your start stuffing envelopes. Yep. Yep. Worked my way up from the mailroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what direction my career is going to go. I wonder about that sometimes. Well, you were doing contracting for a long time, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is that something that you, like, want to keep doing, or...? I think so. I mean, I, I honestly kind of miss hunting for my food. Okay. Um, Made you feel alive? It really did. I mean, like, the amount of money you could earn and, like, a really... I mean, the amount of money you could not earn. <laughs> I'll set my dad. Yeah. But, like... I don't know, like some of the challenges you got and, you know, companies would put, you know, like a lot of their livelihood in your hands and the trust that that took. So the fact that they believed in you, it was a big ego boost. Sure. And then, or like not knowing if you could do a thing, but the company was so desperate that they needed someone that was willing to take it on. And so you put a group together and you could solve the problem and then you actually did it. Should we actually? <laughs> Normally, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was just such a rush. Like, it was it was a really, really good feeling. Yeah, uh, that's cool. Yeah. Before I uh, before I settled down and got a real person job, I was doing contracting for um, about six years, actually. Not and, a similar amount of time. Yeah, so I, I ran this consulting company out of Seattle, and, like, 
did a lot of work for um, hardware startups there. Nice. Okay, so same exact existence, pretty much. Yeah, I think I liked it a lot less than you do, though. Um, Interesting. What do you think that was? So the work was super fun, and being able to like work on a really wide variety of stuff, that was awesome. I loved that part of it, and kind of the, the freedom of it was cool. But the hunting for your food thing, that was the part that was um, never as excited about, and... Um, maybe I just needed a partner who was like really into sales or something, but like, uh, somebody I... described me as like, I probably shouldn't say this, but she said that I've always been a salesman, but I've, I'm a salesman with a highly technical background. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm just the technical background and like yeah. always kind of sucked at the sales part of it. So I would get like, um, actually some pretty amazing clients and did some pretty amazing work, but, um, selling myself at it, making sure that I was getting a good, uh, a good price for the work that I was doing. Like that was just never my strong suit and being able to like go into a company where I'm like only have to do that negotiation once at the very beginning. And then after that, it's all the technical stuff. See, I, I would, I would kind of get a rush from the negotiation. And... <laughs> You're a very different person than me. I, and maybe we should team up. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. There might, might be money to be made there. Fun to be had. Yeah. I, um, so I, I think because my mom was a corporate litigator for a really long time, um, like I got a lot of free training on contract negotiation. Okay. Um, That's very useful. And then I also have uh, a mentor who is an executive at a large corporation. Uh, and between those people, I've, I've gotten, you know, like quite a bit of mentorship for how to, uh, Nice. Negotiate complicated contract. Yeah, that's, I never had that mentorship and that never really burned me. I only really had like one or I've two contracts burned. that went sour. Yeah. Um, but uh, for the most part, um, like, I, I think I was uh, often underpaid, but almost always paid on time. Nice. Um, so, you know, that was nice. Um, I will say it's funny because I got I got paid late very frequently. But... <laughs> um, one interesting thing about consulting and contracting is like you see a really wide variety of projects, which means you see the commonalities for all of them. Yeah, well, um, I like that though. I mean, you're connecting for sure, for sure. You're an ideas broker. Yeah. One thing that I was always surprised by is um, I was doing consulting for a lot of like uh, wearable hardware startups, like. Um, commercial medical monitors, exercise oh, cool. monitors, that kind of stuff. So a lot, awesome. lots of Bluetooth stuff. And um, when I never, I... never super fascinated by that market, but... There's some pretty interesting stuff going on there. My dad was an investor in Bodybug, if you remember that. I don't remember Bodybug. What is this? Uh, I think it became Jawbone, but it was oh, a okay, giant yeah. thing that looked like a Nazi armband with like two metal tabs on it. <gasps> okay. And like Wired did a whole thing on it. I think Astro Teller might have been... Like the dude that were on huh. Google House might have yeah, been yeah. the CEO. And then Evo Storvac, who now works for him again, I think was, I can't remember what the hell his title was there. But it was an interesting team. Uh, they were like highly affiliated with Carnegie Mellon. Okay. I think cool. my dad came in as an investor. And then my cousin was like one of the engineers on it. Cool. Did that work out for him? He got some money years later, I think. Okay. Not a ton, but like a little bit is what I'm told. Cool. Yeah. Better than losing your shirt, I guess. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. But one of the interesting things about the um, the wearable world, uh, and especially like wearable hardware, is that it has a lot of the same constraints as uh, as satellites do. Like in terms of um, like uh, power optimization, size optimization, interesting, um, keeping the weight down. Uh, the exact constraints like differ slightly, but you're basically facing the same constraints. But I mean, that's almost everything when you when you take a step back. For for robotics, yeah, it is, but it's very different than um, uh, stationary hardware. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I used to work for Droid Global on like big mining vehicles, and those were not constraints there. Yeah, yeah. You just you just fed it off a tether, and um, you you dumped in enough lead to just have more ballast than you needed. Right. <laughs> and then and then every like thing with a bending moment was just like thicker than it had to be like <laughs> yeah whereas if you're designing something that you know somebody has to carry around all day or if you're designing something that you're going to launch into space suddenly like every gram counts yeah, um, yeah and sure. like every joule in your battery counts yeah um and so it's uh it's pretty cool how uh 
those two industries are kind of solving like the same problem. Rocket fuel, and... it sounds like it's even more scarce because you can't put a solar panel on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but a lot of the solutions uh, seem to be converging right now, um, especially like when it comes to the the embedded software. So like you're familiar with Ross and probably do a lot of work with it, right? I do a little bit of work. I'm more on the hardware side, the okay. software side. So in, in the satellite I, I, realm... I paid people to work with Ross. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the satellite realm, there's a similar software framework called uh, Core Flight System, CFS. And uh, CFS is solving the exact same problem as Ross in um, almost the same way and uh, is just like optimized for uh, lower power processors, like 20-year-old hardware, because that's what all the NASA hardware is. Wait, what, um, what is it again? Go back a step? Uh, core Flight System? Core CFS? Flight System. Sorry, yeah. CFS. Got it. I, I just zoned out for some reason. Oh, no worries. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's it's really cool to see like uh, mobile robots have ROS, satellites have CFS, um, automotive has a similar thing called like AutoSAR, which um, nice. they do all of their pub sub at like compile time instead of runtime, but it's still kind of solving the same problems. It's really interesting. Yeah, so I'm I'm curious to see how do like, you do pub sub at compile time. I mean, that's... So what they do is they have these different modules, and um, the modules have like. Uh, specifically defined interfaces, you can swap the modules from processor to processor or vehicle to vehicle very easily. And um, you just have like an XML document that says like, connect this module to this this module. And then when you compile it, it um, builds, uh, it does code generation for all of the communications pathways. Oh, cool. Um, uh, automatically builds these um, communication pathways and then compiles them. I see in. what you meant about software engineers being more organized. <laughs> yeah, everything is just like this, totally wobbly tower of automation where like that shit breaks all the time i i do not that's one of the things i hated about working on software was like the two days of dicking around with like getting your you know uh integrated developer environment to work before you could actually write a thing and two days you are lucky <laughs> there, there i was, only, I was spent... only ever an academic research programmer yeah, so I, I, I have spent weeks trying to get my uh development environments tuned just so to be able to produce optimized binaries it's uh and then you actually get to go to work <laughs> <laughs> yeah sometimes the uh the actual software development takes less time than setting up the tool chains yeah no i've experienced that a lot i mean i definitely like in the, in the projects i've supervised later in my career I, i've observed it <laughs> yeah um i don't miss it it's it's not so fun but at the same time it seems like the industry is moving in a direction where that's becoming uh, slightly less of an issue. So there's like um, cool. build frameworks like Bazel where they handle uh, a lot of that for you and what they can't handle, they like hold your hand quite a bit. That's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, it was... Um, How do they like, hold your hand? Uh, one of the things that you can do with Bazel or with Docker um, is one person does all of the setup and then they give that setup to everybody else who's doing software development. Okay, cool. And then like you just have a... But this is um, still a person that works for your company. This isn't like... In this case, yeah. Okay. Um, Bazel can actually do some interesting things where um, it just... Like, none of this is supported, uh, I would think. Yeah. Um, it, it'll just like make a lot of assumptions about what your tool chain should be and you can tweak it if you need to, but um, like the defaults are actually fairly decent if you're not doing something that is... Uh, like on very specific hardware, it needs to be highly optimized. Cool. Um, or with Docker, like you can uh, check out like some pre-made Docker image uh, from like the online Docker repositories and get going. And, like when I got started with Ross, Docker's this was a good cool. I actually never really got it running, to be honest. <laughs> so but I like it in theory. Ross is a good example. When I first got started with Ross, like seven, eight years ago, I spent probably three days messing around with my tool chains, trying to get uh, all of the ROS dependencies installed, get get ROS up and running, get the like hello world examples running. Um, when I started messing around with ROS2, I downloaded a ROS2 Docker image and I was actually playing around with ROS in like 15, 20 minutes. Ooh, um, so, so this is like why uh, having the right Docker image is, is so important and so useful. Yeah, I'm sure you could have just as easily gotten fucked and gotten... <laughs> Maybe. A fragile maybe. one. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, you just look around for something that's highly rated. That makes it's sense. just like, you know, anything else on the internet. But I mean, does your hardware affect it? Like I would think like like a little tweak might might make it so it doesn't work correctly. Yeah, if if you were gonna be running ROS um like on your robot, you would have to end up tweaking it quite a bit. If you're just doing things in simulation, then you Oh I see. Um, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. 
it's been my experience too. Yeah. Um, but it's it's interesting to see how all of these different frameworks like ROS and CFS and Autos are kind of converging, solving the same problem. And I think what with how cars are kind of becoming robots and uh, satellites already are robots and like everybody's kind of solving the same problem. We might have just one framework for all of it here in like 10 or 15 years. You don't think so? I'm not convinced. I mean, software developers do love reinventing the wheel. So everybody's going to want to roll their own thing all the time. Okay, fair enough. Um, and if somebody rolls a really good thing, other people are going to use it. Until they want to roll their own. Funny. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Like a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of wearable hardware uses free RTOS um, as uh, kind of the, the operating system. And um, uh, there are um, satellites running free RTOS right now. And, Interesting. Um, I would not be surprised if there are uh, like vehicles running free RTOS on some of their processors, although it's... Um, I haven't dicked with free RTOS. So I know nothing about that. Uh, I mean, it's just a real-time operating system. It's uh, just like an example of how convergent all this stuff is. As the uh, name would recommend. Or indeed, suggest. indeed. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's like uh, safety certified, um, like safe RTOS is a version of free RTOS that you oh, can cool. put on a, on a vehicle or something like that. That's so, awesome. Yeah. This is another thing that I've learned um, getting more into uh, like some of the mobile robotics and, and spacecraft is how much certification is important. Um, I might be old fashioned, but I'm a little bit skeptical on the idea that you can have a safe PLC or like a safe RTOS. There's uh, I think there's like layer layers of safety. Okay. So like you can just download something off the internet and if it crashes like every 10 minutes, who cares? Um, but well, I mean, until it's running something that could kill a person. Right, and then you want to make sure it doesn't, and then you want to do all the testing and all the certification and all the verification um, in order to say, like, okay, we kind of trust this. And is it 100%? No, definitely not. But is it better than that thing you downloaded off the internet that crashes every 10 minutes? Yeah. Um, and so this is... Well, does it fail in a way that's non-catastrophic? I think when yeah. it does fail... I mean, that yeah, that's a good point. Way. Fail safe versus... Yeah. Um, Feel catastrophic. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, so maybe this this is an old fashioned outlook, but there was uh, a mentor I had at one point in my career that said there is no safety in silicon. Hmm. And that it really stuck with me. Like the idea that like the only way to really have a safe system is a simple circuit. Interesting. It's old school. It's that a is really very old school. Old school. It's definitely not the viewpoint that people take yeah. these days. You can't do a lot of stuff with that viewpoint. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, a lot of work that goes into verifying code line by line, like static code analysis, doing um, uh, validation at runtime, uh, and then also. I know code coverage was a thing last time I looked at it. I'm, I'm showing my ignorance here. Yeah, code coverage is very important. Um, so, like as I move more into software from hardware, uh, writing unit tests. I mean, there's kind of a. Um, analogous thing in hardware where you write you build test fixtures for all yep. of your hardware to make sure that um like it does the thing you i was talking to somebody about golden fixtures the other day golden fixtures okay yeah. as opposed to golden units it'd be golden units I, okay you can have a golden engine in automotive too yeah so like how do you know your test fixture is right if uh like if you have a problem is it the test fixture that's the problem or is it the um, yep. unit that's coming off assembly line that's the problem actually i remember who i was talking to about this it was um director of hardware at Modal AI. Oh, okay. On, on this podcast. Nice. I'll have to look at Vinny, that episode. Yeah, Vinny Kemmler, good dude. But he was uh, he was talking about gold. he he implemented a policy of freezing the firmware as well as the hardware. Smart. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, you don't want to change a variable that you know nobody knows about. Yeah, but to be honest, like the level of obsessiveness and uh, process that goes into freezing hardware, freezing firmware making sure that you like dot all the i's cross all the t's is uh in some in some ways more than the level of effort that goes into actually developing the the product in the first place um yeah i mean i think that's why i, I do better in research and development than i do in yeah r d is very like fly by the seat of the pants and honestly like, fast and loose my my sweet spot in r d is the d 
<laughs> sure. Yeah, and I uh, love the D. Uh, big, big fan of the D. But uh, I don't know. Like, I, I, I like actually making stuff, but I like making stuff that, you know, you just want to get to a difficult goal. Let yeah. somebody else make it work all the time. So there's... There's like research and there's development and then there's um, like productization. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of overlap in terms of methods there. Uh, For sure. But like a lot of things that people think of as like kind of high tech and the next big thing these days is very much still research projects. Like nobody knows how to actually solve it. Like self-driving cars. Like you could not get a self-driving car now if you had all of the money in the world because nobody knows how to do it. Um, and... There's a lot of companies that have cars on the roads right now, but um, there's all these edge cases. They have fairly constrained environments. Um, they only drive in like certain certain times, certain areas. So like this is very much on the research end, maybe edging into development. Development, you've got like uh, things that you know how to do it, and you're just kind of um, like implementing it, putting the pieces together, right? Yeah. And like you said. That can be some of the most fun engineering. I really, really like doing that. Because, uh, like, generally you know that the problem is solvable. If yep. you're just doing research, you might hit a problem and you're like, nobody has done this before. Am I going to spend the next 20 years on this one problem? Yeah. Um, which people have done. <laughs> um, whereas with... It's like a quarter of your life. Yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, with development, you're like, somebody has done this before. I know I can do it. Like, maybe it'll take me a month. Yeah, um, or like, you know, even six or eight months. Yeah. Like, you know, that's that's a good little... Yeah. But productization but, uh, yeah. kind of goes the other way back to um, like the same level of effort as uh, as research because you have to actually make sure that it works and works reliably and works um, if you're producing like a thousand, ten thousand, a million units. And the... So you mean production? Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. Productization, product development. Well, when you say productization, I think of like... Um, support and sales and i'm thinking more like service. design for manufacturing right now got it yeah that's 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 what i surmised from hearing the way you described okay got yeah it. um and uh i did a lot of work at amazon a few years ago uh where um they hired me for the secret project i ended up spending like maybe a quarter of my time working on the secret project and the rest of the time working on the assembly lines for <laughs> Yeah, uh, working on the assembly line for uh, for the secret project hardware. Um, so, like, getting the thing working was actually kind of straightforward. Being able to make a million of them, very difficult. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, and I mean, I remember when I was at Joy, like, I mean, there was just some really boring stuff we had to do to, to get something out in the field. Oh, yeah? Like software in the loop testing. And yeah. It was super fucking boring. I don't know. <laughs> Man, that was my uh, that was my life when I was um, in the space industry. It's like get the software in the loop test working. Okay, now that's working. Get the hardware in the loop test working. Okay, now get the simulators for the sensors working. And like by the time you actually get it on the final hardware, you've tested it like five different times in five different environments. And each of those environments took its own development effort to get set up. But that's how you gain confidence that it's going to work the first time. Yeah, and if sense. you're sending something to space, maybe you only have you one only time. have one chance. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, I worked on something recently where it was um, it was during like the height of the pandizzle. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it was uh, it was no remote team. Although, I mean, you know, I cheated and I, I drove everybody a bottle of whiskey um, when we it hit a milestone. Very motivational. Yeah. You know, you want to be nice. For sure. I uh, kind of fucked myself with another client because it was I got this really hard to find whiskey as a gift for them and I gave them all away. <laughs> but um i uh sorry what were we just talking about i i apologize oh no worries so like with uh with manufacturing um if you're if you're just doing design for manufacturing that's actually pretty difficult and takes a lot of time that that, that like caused sense. you to think of something i'm sure it was oh now i remember now okay so we had like a couple of people just working on like simulation tools to be able to test this in a remote environment oh right and like that was like a big chunk of the project. Like, I mean, there were a lot of billable hours that just went into making tools to test the things. So totally, totally. It was just an interesting, an interesting experience to have had. 
Yeah, and that is... Um, and it wasn't considered wasteful. No, that's that's the day-to-day -day life for... Uh, I don't know if I'd say the majority, but certainly like a lot of engineers in like big companies. Um, have you heard the term sustaining engineering? Uh, no. So once you actually like design for manufacturing, you get your product, you launch it, people are buying it, suddenly you have to do sustaining engineering because you design this thing using... Uh, I think I'm so good. Yeah. So you design your product uh, using hardware, using parts that were available when you designed it. But especially if it's electronics, like you've got chips going end of life all the time. So, oh, especially now. Yeah. For uh, If you like designed your hardware three years ago, but people are still buying it, fucked. you might have to completely redesign it every, yep. every three to four years. Um, and actually a lot of uh, um, uh, kind of industrial equipment is facing this right now where a lot of industrial robots and farm, uh, farm equipment, that kind of thing, uh, that were designed way back in the 80s. Like, oh. people still want to buy the same thing. Interesting. But the companies, like, designed it around 8-bit microcontrollers that, like, aren't even manufactured anymore. So suddenly they have to take this, like, perfectly functional, perfectly working um, software, perfectly working circuit, redesign it around a 32-bit microcontroller. Interesting. And, like, um, that, like, changes the thermal profile, changes the power draw, changes all these other things. So, you, like, for sustaining engineers they end up taking this problem that is like completely solved and just having to tweak it to fit like whatever the new production constraints are for, for what's available. And there just isn't enough demand to produce that obsolete component anymore. I mean, it really depends on, uh, on the industry. Like, like, I mean, you would think if it works and it gets a good result, like make the shitty 8088, you know, like who cares? Like just put it in. I, I think, um, a lot of cutting edge electronics really subsidize manufacturing of of silicon so if you're keeping up with like one or two uh like transistor nodes behind uh cutting edge uh, if you're like at i don't know 65 nanometer or something you can you can get uh hardware pretty easily but if you're a few nodes behind that then you don't have the the whales like um that like intel or, or qualcomm um, like subsidizing the fabs anymore. Yeah, yep, yeah. that makes sense. Uh, so um, yeah, like it's even like $10 if million dollars to a fab or something, right? Like entry level. It's a, something absurd like that. Yeah, um, and uh, you you've got to run it for a long time to to hit break even, and then like operating costs are pretty high too. That makes sense. Um, I have one friend who um, is in the semiconductor industry. I have a few friends that have dabbled, but I have one friend that just, it's like all he does. And when he talks, I'm just confused as hell because it's not my industry. <laughs> it's, um, yeah. it's kind of absurd. If you ever get a chance, go tour a fab. They're super, super interesting. Um, they're like maybe the most technologically advanced places on the planet right now. It seems to be. And... How do you get into one of those though? I feel like they're pretty... Not letting folks in, probably. Uh, there's a few, um, like Intel has a little museum. They don't actually have a fab um, in uh, uh, in California, but you can like go to this little museum where they like show you what the fabs are look like, and you kind of walk through and see all the stages. Oh, cool. Um, so that's uh, that's what I've seen. Although, um, you I can feel probably... like when you see a real thing, though, like museum is ain't shit. That's that's fair. Yeah, like, yeah. Because museums are the old shit. <laughs> <laughs> but man, seeing. Yeah. Um, even seeing like the old shit in the museum, that yeah, it's good. it's amazing stuff. Like that's I, I saw the Air and Space Museum as a kid, and then I worked for SpaceX. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, museums and shit. Yeah. Shit. Um, but no, like because you've got uh, like Qualcomm and Intel subsidizing all the latest processor nodes, it's fairly easy to get that kind of stuff. That makes a lot of sense because they're the yeah. ones who can afford that. But then everybody else uh, downstream of that, if you're like not targeting cutting edge. Well, also, stuff can just go end of life for you. Yeah, and if you make farming equipment, you probably don't sell enough units to justify a fab. Yeah. No, no, you would not. Yeah. Um, for myself, like I designed this um, little uh, uh, kind of radio add-on board for the Intel Edison. Cool. The Intel Edison was a competitor for the Raspberry Pi for a while. And Intel just canceled that because they weren't selling enough of them. Intel canceled a bunch of their stuff. Like, they I mean, really the real did, sense yeah. Got yeah. Um, so like I took this, this radio board that I had designed around the Intel Edison, I redesigned it around a different module that was, uh, kind of the same form factor as the Edison 
and um, was really excited. This the module. Nvidia Jets and Nano. No, that was that wouldn't way too, uh, too power hungry for this application. Um, the Nano though was I thought that was basically like a Raspberry Pi. Even the Raspberry Pi is kind of too powerful for oh, for this particular application. Like the the Edison was nice because it was like um, uh, you know it could run Linux, but it was still like very very power efficient. Actually, um, yeah, actually, cool. uh, largely because it didn't have a um, uh, any kind of graphics at all. Like no GPU, no graphics front end. Um, it was oh, really um, really intended as like a, a peripheral node. Um, Kind of like Bluetooth Wi-Fi interaction only. That's cool. Um, whereas like Raspberry Pi has uh, a GUI. Like, yeah, all all of that hardware the to support that, that, that takes a few seconds to go to yep. the next thing. All of the hardware on the chip to support that draws power. You know. I'm sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, oh man, I forget. After the Intel Edison got canceled, I designed this. I redesigned this thing around this other hardware. I forget the name of the board. But I was super excited because they promised 10 years of support. They were going to be selling this thing for 10 years. I could. That's a campaign promise. You can't believe that. I got my first prototypes in and they canceled the module the next day. Like they didn't even go uh, into mass manufacturing. They like canceled the module before they even uh, were, were selling publicly. Nice. So <laughs> not, not for me. Um, it's been. Uh, Sorry, I meant that. I mean, like. like after that, the uh, the product I was working on, like we just shut it down. Uh, Blowtastic. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, but like that's that's kind of the world that you live in if you're doing sustaining engineering. Is like yeah. um, you've got this like moving target of hardware that you're trying to design your stuff around. Actually, um, SK is bidding on a project like that right now. Oh yeah. Yeah, trying to make something uh, where all the components are obsolete again. So it's sustaining engineering. There you go. Yeah, it's very different. Uh, very different constraints than yeah. you're used to if you're doing something that's Do you have not... any bandwidth? <laughs> <laughs> mm. I, I think maybe maybe not for a couple months. Um, that's fair. But, uh, oh man. Talking about uh, contracting and consulting, I really loved consulting for startups because they were always doing something new. Yep. Sustaining engineering is like... But it always broke my heart to see them go out of business. Yeah, same. Hundreds same. of startups I helped and won their trust and they went out of business. Yeah. Yeah. But sustaining engineering is like, honestly, for me, a little boring because you're doing something, you already know how to do it. It's already been done before. Um, like, this is kind of why, personally, I like the well, R&D I mean, side I, of things. I guess that's kind of like, um, what is it like? Uh, I haven't really done this at a heavy scale, but I guess sort of doing it at form logic um the hell is it called uh industrial automation like like systems integration okay I feel like it's kind of like that where it's like not super duper exciting like it's yeah kinda like... i mean it's great but it's, cool it's important shit. but but there's some cool shit that you see like i i, I one of my friends showed me a 32 million dollar line um and i won't Whoa. say what company it was for because i'm pretty sure i wasn't supposed to see it like but... a manufacturing line yeah oh cool very cool and it was it was super neat like like it would change out its tooling when they would wear out and like yeah man cutting edge manufacturing lines are there were just inspection state like there were cognex inspection stations between every operation okay and then nice. there was pneumatic blow off like if if something failed it would just Sweet. Put, put it in the garbage so. i uh i worked on a assembly line once that had uh automatic x-ray inspection so they would just run it through an x-ray oh cool um for for like well see that's that's really i feel like that's systems integration thinking right it's just like well we'll, we'll do that fucking x-ray do it yeah put, put an x-ray machine <laughs> if your hardware costs enough that makes total sense yeah, yeah um, for sure but uh yeah if, if you need to get your yields up um that's uh that's critical and we like, get an interesting job one time where the the client came to us and said uh, that they had this, I'll say, bit of consumer electronics that was failing, um, but like at weird times, like it would fail like two years out or one year out, and then they'd have these big groups, and we looked at it like seasonally, and it was bigger in the winter. And okay. Sounds like a temperature or humidity thing? ESD. ESD. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nobody's wearing the wrist straps. Oh. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> People often assume that like modern uh modern ships are a lot more immune to that and to some extent they are but some of them just like are not yeah well i mean it's like 
touch a thing, look at the distance between your thing, and then realize that like that you just discharge yeah. thirty thousand volt. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, when I was doing, um, maybe thirty thousand is the wrong number, but you know what I mean. I mean that actually sounds pretty reasonable yeah. to me. Um, like the the breakdown resistance of air is pretty high, so if you get a large shock, that's it's going to be a uh, kilovolts. Yeah. Um, but like in uh, when I was like just doing hardware hacking for myself, I would like you know throw stuff on a desk, um, solder it up right there. Who cares? Um, but in the space industry things are much more controlled. Obviously they have to be, but like you, you'll control the humidity in your, um, uh, in your e-labs to like within, uh, like plus or minus 5% or something, which in the winter in Pittsburgh, that's hard. <laughs> that's pretty cool though. I mean, yeah. well, I mean, controls engineering is a different kind of nerdy. Like, yeah, I almost took a job as director of product development for a company that was just making, like, it would have been boring as shit. They were doing, like humidifiers. Okay. Yeah. But they would have put me in charge of thirty people my first day on the job. So yeah. fun little good stroke to the ego. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So oh man. The environmental maintenance, something you really don't think about in the R and D field, but in like manufacturing, assembly line, sustaining engineering, very important. So it's the weird things that you learn when you are like making things that thousands of people use every day. Wait, go back a step. What was, <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, just environmental maintenance. Like making sure that you're designing something for the environment that it's going to be used in. And, um, Oh, for sure. No, like, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, even understanding the environment that you're going to be, uh, using something in. Even ingress protection testing is yeah. Pretty brutal when you're trying to pass it. I, I gained a much better appreciation for what hardware gets put through after I had kids. Like seeing the way my toddlers treat their their <laughs> tablet. Oh man, I uh, I kind of want to go back and apologize to some of the like design for manufacturing people that were really like uh, harping on me to like design things more uh, more reliably because man, they were totally right about what needs to happen. It's pretty, dude. One, I had a client come to me one time and I asked them, like, what drop test standard they wanted to hit. They came back to me with mil spec 810G. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which I'm like, what are you, high? Like, are, were they was, selling to the military? No, it was a consumer drone. It made no sense at all. But they had, oh. they had a person, they had, a, this was a startup. So they had an engineer okay. in their team that had worked with that spec. So Got they it. just pulled it out of their ass. Like, oh, we know this spec. We can. That was it. Gotcha. Yeah. I was like, so you want your drone to be resistant to machine gun fire and function at 60,000 <laughs> feet. They were like, well, uh. <laughs> that's going to be a fun drone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want that drone. I tell you what. Yeah. No, I, I want, I want it in every color. <laughs> But yeah, no, that was funny. And then they also wanted it to be uh, inexpensive. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Right? <laughs> yeah, no, the amount of times I've had a startup come to me and say that they wanted something fast, cheap, and uh, quick. Sorry, fast, cheap, and good. Yeah, like... yeah. I, uh, sometimes I had startups come to me with, like, really amazing product ideas, and I'm like, I... I really love this thing that you want. I realize that you don't have the money to make it. Let me just do you a favor and I'll, I'll, I'll do this thing. And that has almost yeah, always been a mistake. It's almost always been a mistake. Cause but then you're they dragged in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, also like the people who come sit and say like, I want it like good, fast and cheap. Uh, if you make it for them and you make it cheap at your own cost, uh, they're not going to understand what it costs. Oh, so they're I not going to be able to take it to the next step. They're going to be like just super surprised and killed at the next filter. Yeah. yeah um, so like uh, I, I made that mistake a couple of times and start, started seeing people like, you know, I would get them um, proof of concepts or I'd get them prototypes I've done um, that before. To, to go take to um, like factories and start getting quotes. And then they just like drop off the face of the earth. Um, I've also like trying to build my career. I've given like 40 free hours of consulting to a bunch of startups. Yeah. And friends for life. <laughs> yeah. That's uh... a lot of those people when their startups failed, like got real jobs and still remembered me. <laughs> I, I did yeah. a very similar thing when I was first getting started. Like uh, I did a lot of work out of this um, hackerspace in Seattle and a lot of the work that I did out of there was um, pro bono. 
Yeah. And makes sense. kind of like that ended up getting me quite a bit of, of paid work later on. Nice. So yeah. um, okay. I, I feel like I definitely did the like um start off making zero money and like do it for the experience, but it actually totally worked for me. My first job I ever got in contract engineering cost me seven thousand dollars. Oh <laughs> wow. I don't think I don't think I ever made that big of a, a trade. Oh, you think that's a big one? <laughs> <laughs> I made a fifty thousand dollar fuck up another time. Whew. Well, the project wasn't negative fifty, but the the profit margin would have been fifty, and I spent it all correcting a fuck up. Oh wow, that wasn't bad in that deliver. <laughs> yeah, man, it sounds like you are much higher variance than I was in terms of pricing. Like I, I got my my pricing pretty dialed in to the point where I almost always made them exactly what I expected. Interesting, but like. I think I was not putting the margins in that you were like, I never had a, a contract where I would have made 50,000 on it, which maybe that's my mistake. Again. I've had ones where I made more than that. Like... Man, <laughs> good thing you have all that experience with, uh, with contracts, right? I, like I said, we should team up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, my firm was probably right. Like I probably am a salesperson with a highly technical background. I mean, that's, that's one of the things I wish I had known when I was getting started is like, even if you're doing like purely technical work for purely technical people or purely technical companies, like having the like, uh, interpersonal skills and the like business skills to, um, to get a good contract is like still critical. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's really like, I'm, I'm aggressive with contract negotiation. <laughs> You should be right. It cost me a lot of jobs. Yeah. Like there's a lot of jobs I haven't signed because the contract negotiation fell apart because I didn't like the terms. I mean, it sounds like that's uh, like a bullet that you dodged, right? Um, like for myself, I'm not contracting anymore, right? Like there's a reason that it didn't work for me, and maybe if I were like a lot more um, a lot more harsh with my contract negotiation, it would have worked out better. When I was in peak season, I could make six times my current salary doing contract work. <laughs> All right, that's, but, that's pretty nice, pretty solid. Yeah. The the variability, I assume, is still there, though. So, like, lean season and fat season, right? That's it, right? So you want to kill yourself when you hit a dry spell. Yeah. And that's, you, you feel worthless. Yeah. Yeah, that can be hard. Yeah, yeah, sure. Especially... Which also, I mean, I have a lot more empathy for some of the prospects that have, like, I want to be careful what I say here. So, um, just working within a company framework, right? I mean, I feel like there's a lot more um, approvals that things have to go through, like decisions. And I didn't always understand that when I was doing contract engineering oh. because it was a very small team. And so it was like me and a gang of mercenaries. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, I've always been very honest with the people that are working for me, you know, or working with me, I should say. Um, and, you know, I'm just like, okay, it looks like the client is going to pay a little bit late. Here's what we're going to do to handle that. Yeah. You might have to get strung out for a week or two. Are you okay with that? That's, that's a hard conversation to have. And I always liked those challenges. Like, it, yeah. it, I'm weird. Cause like, I think a lot of people <laughs> think that that's like one of the stressful bits of it. Like I fucking love working with personnel like i don't think it's it might be a little bit of an ego thing where like you know you want to be like mini god or whatever but i, th I think part of it is just like it, it's just a fun challenge like i like i like being okay. like a little bit of a therapist a little bit of okay i um when i was contracting the most i ever had at one time was two 1099s okay. um i had uh had 75 whew, okay uh the times where uh, we had dry spells and I had those like, uh, two people that I was like trying to feed, uh, to feed. Yeah. Like and they're those were super stressful for me. They're yeah. 1099s, but also like I was their like primary client. Right. Ah, uh, brutal. Well, and, and you do feel a little bit bad when like you get somebody excited about a thing and the thing doesn't happen. That's very true. Yeah. yeah. But like, I've, I've had a few friends, um, that have tried to get my folks work um and 
you know, I say friends, I mean, colleagues, really, it's, it's just okay. people I know professionally where we know what each other do. And, you know, they've said, we need these things, you know, our robotics, uh, our robot needs an overhaul in this particular way. Okay. And I know you can do it. And I'm like, all right, happy to do it. You know? And so we talk and then like upper management just kiboshes it, you know? And it never oh, happens. gotcha. So, yeah. Huh. Interesting. This is another like side of the um, consulting field that I never saw. Again, like probably because you're the the sales guy, right? So you're like out there meeting Every people. Every business and... owner is an expert in sales. Yeah, I mean, I was a business owner for six years, never became an expert. Also, not a business owner anymore. So maybe that explains it. I still kept SKA. I mean, it's it's operating on life support now. Like, yes, yeah. it's, it's a very diminished caseload. Are you still taking contracts though? Even we're bidding on small? a. Uh refinery inspection robot contract right now that sounds fun yeah but like i mean if i were doing it full time we'd be bidding on five things right yeah so yeah um but yeah i mean you know i gotta keep my interest up i mean like i don't know um you gotta keep your skin in the game yeah i, I like the challenge like i yeah. i want to i want to continue to you want to hunt for your food I wanna hunt for you're not food. on the hunt you're yeah. just you're jonesing for it that's it. I mean, I, I just feel like a worthless human being if I'm not okay. earning my pay. <laughs> so Some people would say working at your job is earning your pay. I mean, I like to think I earn that pay too, but I mean, maybe it's a gambling addiction. Like, I, I get very excited. Like, do you know, <laughs> I shouldn't say the name of the company. There's this mediocre software firm in, in the boonies in Pittsburgh. Okay. And I've bumped into them at a few networking events. Um, I'm going to be intentionally vague here because I don't want to call anyone out in particular. But I remember I was at one event and I think it was their head of operations, which the head of operations is supposed to be a hardworking person that makes things happen. Sure. And is very detail oriented and doesn't let anything get by them. Sure. Um, I had been up for two nights straight working on something or another. I don't remember what. Um, and this person saw me and was like, why do you do that? Why you? And I'm like, well, you know, I mean, I was trying to solve the problem. I said, well, why do you do that? And I'm like, because I'm fucking broken. <laughs> <laughs> That's, there's people who go to work and they work 40 hours and they're done. And um, I understand that way more now that I like, you know, have kids and have a life outside of work and, yeah. and not running my I own don't business. Have so my, my whole legacy is professional. Yeah. But I, at the same time, like, I want it to work. I want to see it working. I want to, like, I, I got into the field in the first place because I like building stuff and seeing stuff work and, like, making new things. Yeah. And uh, I find it very difficult to just do, like, to, to like, clock out at 40 hours. Like, yeah, that's, that's same. Fine. I mean, like... I mean, these days, it's not that. I, I maybe work a 50-hour week. It's a little bit shameful. But, like, <laughs> I don't know. I was yeah. doing, like, an 80 or a 90 before this. <laughs> like, it's been years since I've done that. And yeah. to be honest, I don't miss that. Like, the the times when it's been, like, nose to the grindstone, I, to miss, work, I like, miss the wins. I don't miss the losses. Yeah. Like, when you put in those yeah. kind of hours and you don't get the bid, it's fucking... Yeah, pretty for heartbreaking. Sure. Um, like, I've spent seven thousand dollars on more than one project that didn't make money. You know, or it just was a negative. Right. Yeah. But you know, it's been wind stops at that. <laughs> it was just the, the highest high. You know. Yeah, I mean, you can have high variance, but as long as your as your mean is high enough, it's totally yeah. worth it. I right? mean, I'm working for somebody now, so. Yeah. 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 Um, I I think. So I originally like shut down my consulting business and went and got a real person job. Um, when I found out that, uh, that we were having twins, like I was prepared for one, kid. <laughs> two kids. I cannot be like, I, I need better insurance for that. That's hilarious. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm definitely at the point where, you know, I, I miss it. I want to go back to um more control more end-to-end -end input and end-to-end -end input well, see, I, I, I really miss that too like i miss being able to go and just say 
this is what we need to get it done. And your client is paying you, we'll say X number of dollars per hour. Yeah. So they don't want to spend that twice because they are micromanaging you. Yeah. And so totally. they leave you alone and you, you can just be like, okay, this is what needs to happen. Totally. And you do it and then they love you and you're a hero. And it, it's, but it you also so good. You, you generally get things, um, or at least the way that my contracts were usually framed is like, here is this like thing that you are building. You're building the whole thing. You're, you're making it work. And so you end up touching like this really wide variety of different, um, like pieces of hardware or skill sets. And, um, that's pretty different than how like, uh, most 40 hour a week, like salary jobs are like where they want you to have your one cog you you fully understand yeah. and like you be an expert on that and you just do that and you'll be the expert. Yeah. Which, it's, kind of, it's kind of killing me inside if I'm yeah. being honest. Like, I mean, it makes total sense to the company, right? Cause like, as long as they've got all their experts and like, they like pass their things from one person to another at the right time, everything goes really fast. But from a, like a personal, like uh fulfillment perspective, like, it's nice to go deep. It's also nice to go wide. And I want to go wide again. I completely agree. We should team up. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I won't go there, but <laughs> too, too close to home. <laughs> I miss being able to control like all of a project and see all yeah. those different aspects. Yeah. So the, um, the best large companies I've seen, like recognize this, yeah, and make it a point of moving their engineers around so they get to actually see all the different things. So like they go deep on one thing for a little while. A year later, they go deep on another thing. In for business a while. school, they call that task diversity. Oh, did they? Yeah, that's such a fancy term. Yeah, that, that was the name that I got my bachelor's in business administration along with my bachelor's in computer science. Cool. <laughs> All right. So, Again, this explains why you got such good contract terms. I am not really. That business degree is not worth the paper it's printed out. For those listening, do not go to business school. It's a waste <laughs> of money. Um, and, and everybody told me this. Like, my parents, mentor, like, fucking adults were like, don't go to fucking, unless it's Wharton. Oh, yeah. Or Harvard. Well, I mean, like, like Wharton and Harvard, you're not there for the business connection. school. You're there for the connections. That's yeah. That's right. And Carnegie Mellon was a little bit like that. Yeah. yeah. Is that where you went? Uh, for for my master's in robotic systems development. Okay. But um, I went to Pitt for business school. I was at KS Western before that. I didn't like Cleveland, so I transferred. Okay. Um, and uh, I want to say that uh, the bachelor's in business admin, I, I learned more in my first six months of... Uh, running a business than I did in uh, four years of bachelor's of business admin. And then the master's in robotic systems development at Carnegie Mellon was like, I want to say three parts BS to one part, you know, MBA. Interesting. Yeah. It was an interesting degree. That's, that's such a weird mix. I would not expect the that. The program kind of director way. at the onset of the guy uh, at the program, it was Hagen Schempf. Not familiar. He he had this thing called Dragon Runner that sold to Kinetic North America, which is the 52nd largest defense manufacturer okay. in the world. And it was an invertible surveillance robot, like a pack bot type thing. Interesting. It almost looked like a kite from the side because it had four. So the the wheel configuration was like there were these two wheels and then there were these wheels. It was it was bizarre looking. Uh, so I'm sorry, your... my brain is so broken right now. <laughs> So your your master's degree was like actually a lot more businessy than roboticsy. It sounds like it was more roboticsy than businessy, but it was okay. more businessy than the average robotics degree. Weird. Okay, why was that? Um, so when Hagen pitched this program to me, I was in uh, Howie Chosett's class. If you know that guy, I don't know. Most he... most of the Pittsburgh greats, like fair enough. I I don't know yet. Head in the clouds. Uh, he makes snake robots. Cool. Okay. Totally useless, but <laughs> uh, you know, interesting All right. academically. All right. I stuff. mean, pipe inspection, right? Like, I, yeah, but there's other ways to do that. Okay. Fair. Um, but anyway, I mean, you know, smart guy, smarter than me, and uh, you know, uh, he um, 
had he gave the floor to Hagen, and Hagen comes in and he goes, um, "So many of you will go on to be um, a senior research scientist, yeah, but some of you want to be, you know, a, a chief technical officer, a chief executive officer. So how many of you are computer science majors? Show of hands. How many of you are mechanical engineering majors? You know, how many of you are?" Electrical engineering majors. <laughs> okay. I was like, how many of you are business majors? I was the only one that raised my hand. <laughs> so, okay. But I also raised my hand for computer science, man. And so, sure. Double points. Yeah, exactly. And, he, and then he was talking about, like, you know, being able to negotiate and all this shit. And then people had these plays there. He's like, the business major gets it. <laughs> so, I don't know. He, okay. he, he, he kind of got my heart at that point. And so okay. I... That was the only master's program I applied to, and I got in. Gotcha. And, uh, huh. interesting. I even look at my GRE score. I just submitted it and <laughs> kind of rolled the dice. I mean, I've done that a bunch of times. So, like, when I got the SpaceX internship, it was the only internship I applied to. Hmm. Like, I didn't, I didn't diversify at all. And then I, I worked for Deep Local, which is an ad agency here in Pittsburgh. It was the only internship I applied to that year. Okay. That's kind of the way that I did things as well. Like, I, uh, in college, had an internship with Tethers Unlimited, which is a, like, space tether company. Nice. Um, and I just, like, went online, found the CEO's email address, and just emailed <laughs> them, like, your company's amazing. I just I just want to work with you guys. Let me in. And uh, I, I think they took pity on me. But, Have you ever uh, talked to Honeybee Robotics? I've heard of them. I haven't talked to them. Um, Hill Davis is an internet, like... I, I tried to work for those guys, but the amount they offered just was not enough to pay off my student loans. So. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't. But I, I, I know a few people have worked there, and that's the, the amount everybody gets. But gotcha. you're, you're in Brooklyn or Pasadena making, I guess, on the NBA. It's like 76000 a year. That is not a lot for a robotic Brooklyn or field. Pasadena. Yeah. yeah. Your rent is four grand a month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. Couldn't afford to do it. Clear Path Robotics was similar. It was like they wanted to pay like sixty thousand Canadian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's uh, it's like guys, I have student loans. I can't do this. I'm sorry. Man, it's really interesting the uh, diversity of salaries in like robotics adjacent fields. I feel like old school companies that are building, um, like I don't know, oil and. Uh, oil rig inspection robots or something are offering like 60 to 100k and then there's companies that are offering like 150 200 um like anything software adjacent basically yeah yeah for sure well and then i mean like nvidia i think pays like systems engineers 230 Ooh, okay plus stock in nvidia which is yeah balling out of control yeah for sure so Oh man, and will be for as long as crypto is uh, exciting. Do you think that's the only driver though? Because I feel like robotics buys their hardware. Like at SpaceX, we were using it for propulsion analysis. Like I think it, they have a lot of markets. They yeah, they they have a I lot mean, of gamers, markets. But I, you know, like, <laughs> sure, you know. uh, I I gotta say though, I think the crypto people are what are driving the uh, the real gains there, like. Crypto is so volatile. That's interesting. Like, well, Nvidia stock has also been volatile. So maybe you're right. There, there might be a direct correlation there. I mean, when... I, I have a few shares of Nvidia, and it's been like nine percent up one day, which is yeah. terrifying. Oh man, that's. I I would not sell if I had Nvidia. Yeah, but I'm at the same not, time, but like that's not my only thing. It's yeah. not most of my portfolio. Yeah. 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 Um, but like. I, I think that if uh, if the political environment doesn't go well for crypto over the next couple of years, they are going to grow more slowly. Um, although... I actually knew the founder's son back in high school. Really? Dave wow. Malachowski, Ryan Malachowski was his son. Okay. Yeah. Was it like... I mean, I have to assume he was kind of a normal guy, right? Mm. He, he was kind of like, he, he looked up to, um, I want to say Stanley Kubrick. Okay. And so he was like, he was like making independent films and. Normal guy. Yeah. Like it's fun. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Very cool. Like motorcycles. Like, uh... I mean, you've heard the uh, coding drunk thing, right? 
you like drink drink a cup of coffee, drink a, a bottle of beer, and then you like go and you code and you're just like the right the right level. It's like a bomber peak. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Actually I did do that a couple of times when I was soldering um like uh BGA parts. It's like drink the coffee so that you're really precise, but then drink a beer so that you're like not shaking. Up. Yeah. yeah. Uh that I do not recommend it, but it did work for me one time when I had like the, uh, <laughs> this like real bitch of a uh BGA part to solder on. That's funny. Had to align it by hand. Wait, wait, you did BGA by hand? It's possible. I thought there was like surface tension pulling that in. Um, so you have to align it. You have to get it aligned properly, and then um, uh, surface tension will pull it in beyond that. Yeah. But also, if you are doing rework, you have to pull it off first, um, like rework, put it back on. So like a lot of times you'll be like you'll have your tweezers, you'll be under your scope, and um, like you don't want your hands shaking while you've got your tweezers working on your part, right? Otherwise, you're just gonna like smear your solder balls all over everything. Yeah, but if you have shaky hands, you're an old bitch. <laughs> oh man! Apparently, twenty three year old me was an old bitch. <laughs> <Touché. laughs> all right. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's late. We can cut it. This has been fun. It has been, yeah. Thank you for having me. Morgan Redfield, thank you for coming. It's been a pleasure. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button. Or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.